Welcome to this video on how to start Docker containers with the Docker Run command. In this video, we'll explore the Docker Run command, which is essential for starting new containers from images. We'll start with the basics and then progress to more advanced topics like port mapping and mounting volumes from the Docker host. By the time you finish this video, you'll know everything about using Docker Run to manage your containers. So, let's get started. Before we get into the Docker Run command, it's important to understand the difference between Docker images and Docker containers. A Docker image serves as a template for creating Docker containers, from which one or more containers can be started. The image contains the instructions, code, runtime, libraries, and dependencies necessary for running the container. Each container has its own isolated environment, ensuring applications run independently without affecting other containers or the host system. Remember that a container is a running instance of a Docker image. You cannot delete an image if there is one or more containers created from that image. You have to remove all containers created from the image before removing it from your computer. Docker provides a specific command for downloading images known as Docker pull. However, it's worth noting that the Docker run command also has the capability to download images. When you start a new container using the Docker run command, it first checks if the required image is available on the Docker host. If not found, it automatically fetches the image from Docker Hub. This happens only once. For subsequent executions, the same image will be reused. Now let's dive into the Docker run command itself. The core concept is quite simple. All you need is the image name. With that, Docker run will create a new container based on that image. Depending on the image and how you want your containers set up, you'll add different options. For example, one common option is minus D, which basically lets you start the container in the background, so you can still use your terminal for other stuff. Now, for certain operating system containers like Ubuntu and Fedora, we need to include something called a sudo terminal for the container to keep running. You can do this by adding the minus T option. Additionally, Docker assigns a random name to containers when you create them. This can be impersonal and hard to manage, especially if you're working with multiple containers. The minus minus name option lets you give your containers a custom and meaningful name. This makes it easier to identify and manage them later. These are the basic command options, but there are also advanced options like minus P for port mapping and minus V for mounting volumes from the host machines. We'll cover these options in separate sections later in this video. Before we jump into the demonstration, there's one more thing to keep in mind. Docker images often come with different versions, identified by tags. Think of tags like labels on software versions. For instance, the Ubuntu image has tags like 22.04 and 24.04 .04 to specify different Ubuntu versions. We specify the tag using a colon after the image name. If you don't specify a tag, Docker will default to using the latest tag, which typically represents the latest stable release of the image. If you want to find out the different versions available for an image, you can visit the Docker Hub website. You'll see all the different versions listed there for a particular image. All right, now that we've covered the basics of the Docker run command, let's see it in action. We'll start by creating a simple Ubuntu container. To keep things clear, we won't use any additional options for now. Here when we execute the docker run command, it notifies us that it cannot find the Ubuntu image on our local system. As a result, it proceeds to retrieve the Ubuntu image from the Docker Hub repository. Now that the command has been completed, let's run the docker ps command to check if any containers are currently running. The docker ps is the command to list running containers. However, we don't see any running containers in this system. So what I am going to do is add the minus A option to the PS command to list all containers. All right, now we can see that we have one container based on the Ubuntu image. However, as you may notice, it's listed as exited instead of running. So what happened here is that Docker created a new Ubuntu container, but it stopped the container immediately after it started. This occurred because, as mentioned in the previous section, operating system containers like Ubuntu need to be started with the minus T option if we want to keep the container running. 
So what I am going to do now is start a new container with the minus T option and let's see what happens. This time the container started and provided us with a terminal session inside it. However, the issue is that we can't do anything with this terminal anymore, not even exit from the container. This is because the container was started in the foreground. Docker now utilizes this terminal to display the standard output of the container. The only way to regain control of our terminal is by logging into the Docker host from another terminal and stopping the container. All right, we got our terminal back, but we had to stop the container. So with that in mind, let's start a new container, but this time we will also add the minus D option to start the container in the background. Okay, a new container was created. We know this because the ID of the container was printed to the terminal. If you run the docker ps command, you'll see that we have a running container. However, it didn't take over our terminal session because this container is running in the background. So now we have a container running in the background. The next question is, how do we access the terminal? This is where the docker exec command comes in. It allows you to execute commands within a running container, providing an interactive session. To use the docker exec command for an interactive session, we need to include the minus i and minus t options. Then, we specify the ID or the name of the container, followed by the shell we want to start. In this case, it's going to be the bash shell. You'll notice the prompt change to the ID of the container. This confirms that we are now inside the container. Inside the container, I'll run this command to check which version of Ubuntu is installed. So this is Ubuntu 24.04. Remember, we did not specify the version when we started the container, so it downloads the latest stable version of Ubuntu. I'll exit the container by typing exit, and then back in the host, I'll run the docker images command to see the list of images available on this computer. So, we have one image, which is Ubuntu latest. If we run the docker ps minus a command, you can see we have three containers, all based on the same image. Before moving on to more advanced command options of docker run, let's see how we can stop start and remove containers. To stop a running container, use the docker stop command. Simply follow it with the name or ID of the container. Remember, when specifying the ID of a container with any Docker command, you can use just a part of the ID, as long as it does not conflict with other containers. So right now we don't have any running containers. If I want to start a container, I can use the docker start command. To remove a container, you can use the docker rm command. However, you can't remove a running container. The container must be stopped before removing it with the docker rm command. What about removing an image? The command is docker rmi, but here's the thing. You can't remove an image if there are containers created from it. So, in our case, we can't remove the Ubuntu image because we have two containers created from it. If I want to remove the Ubuntu image, first I need to remove all instances of it. Then, we can remove the image using the docker rmi command. Container IPs are internal. Outside the Docker host, you only have access to the host's IP address. But what if you want to access services running inside a container from outside the Docker host? That is where port publishing comes in. 
Port Publishing allows you to map a port on your host machine to a port inside the container. This means that any traffic coming to this port on the host machine will be directed to the corresponding port within the container. For example, suppose you have a web server running on port 80 inside your container. By using Port Publishing, you can make that web server accessible to the outside world through a specific port on your host machine. With the Docker Run command, Port Publishing is done using the minus P option. First, we specify the port on the host machine, followed by a colon, and then the port on the container to which traffic should be redirected. All right, let's see Port Publishing in action. We're going to use the Apache HTTPD image. But first, we'll start an Apache container without any port mapping. So we've got our Apache container up and running. Let's try accessing it using the host machine's IP address. As you can see, we're unable to access the web server from outside. This is because the host is not redirecting incoming traffic on port 80 to the Apache container. Since we've seen what happens without port mapping, let's delete this container and start a new container. This time, we'll map port 80 on our Docker host machine to port 80 on the Apache container. With our container with port mapping up and running, it's time to put port publishing to the test. Let's see if we can finally access the web server running inside the container. Sure enough, it works. We can see the default web page of the Apache web server. All right, we've successfully mapped our Apache container to port 80. Now let's explore a scenario where we want to run another web server. This time we will use Nginx. However, Nginx also runs on port 80, but the host port 80 is already bound to the Apache container. So we'll need to use a different port on the host. For this example, we'll publish port 8080 on the Docker host to port 80 on the Nginx server. This configuration will redirect any traffic coming to port 8080 on the Docker host to port 80 on the Nginx container. Let's see if it works. Perfect. There's the Nginx welcome page on port 8080. Now we have two web servers on our Docker host, each using a different port. The last command option we're going to explore is minus V, which enables us to mount a directory from the host machine to the container. To demonstrate, we'll create a folder on the host machine called data where we can store some important files. Then we'll launch a new Ubuntu container and mount this data folder in the MNT directory. This way, any files we place in the data folder on the host machine will be accessible and persistent within the container. Okay, we have a container up and running. Let's start an interactive session to the container and see if we can access the data folder. So there it is. This is the folder we mounted from the host machine. It's now accessible within the container at the slash MNT directory. This folder is writable. If you need it to be read-only, you'll have to add the RO option when you create the container. Let's see read-only mode in action. We'll create a new container. This time I will add the RO option after the mount point. This will make the data folder accessible, but unwritable within the container.
Before finishing the video, there's something I want to mention. There's another command identical to docker run called docker container run. These two commands, docker run and docker container run, basically do the same thing. Docker container run is the newer version. Both commands perform the basic function of creating and starting containers. However, the newer version hasn't gained widespread adoption, and the Docker community tends to use the shorter, original Docker run command. Alright, that brings us to the end of this video on using the Docker run command. I hope you found this introduction to Docker containers helpful. If you found this video helpful, don't hesitate to like, share, and subscribe for more Docker tips and tutorials.